25% of our brides are secondary brides and their age is 42 to 45 and older, right? 75% of our brides are under that age because it's first time weddings. So we've got a bifurcated strategy that we have to adjust to, which enables us to serve both sets of brides. You're listening to Retail Remix, your inside access to candid conversations with the people shaping retail's future. Here's your host, Alicia Esposito. I'm always fascinated by brands that have a long and highly considered purchase journey. The process of finding the right product is extensive. It requires a lot of research, a lot of inspiration gathering, and a lot of deep thought into what the consumer really wants. On one hand, that could be a fridge, but on the other, that could be as emotional and important for consumers as a bridal gown. That's why I was super excited to sit down with Kelly Cook, who is spearheading a lot of the incredible work that David's Bridal is doing on the marketing and loyalty side of things. And, you know, our goal was to really dig into what the company is doing from a loyalty perspective, how their programs have had to evolve with consumer needs and expectations. But we really had a much larger conversation around the evolution of brand and brand experience, especially as Gen Z and Gen Alpha really set a new standard for how brands show up in the world. And Kelly has so much experience. She really is hands-on in the day-to-day operations of the business, gathering data and insight and aligning with her executive team to really understand what consumers are doing, what they're thinking, what they're feeling. And it really trickles down into everything that she's doing. So listen in, because I think even if you're not in this world of bridal or even formal wear, there are some great takeaways here that you'll be able to apply. Kelly, thanks so much for being on the show today. It is so great to have you on. Thank you, Alicia. So nice to meet you. Yeah, likewise. And we have so much to get into about all of the incredible work that David's Bridal is doing. But to start, I always like our guests to share a little bit about their day to day. Obviously, we're in retail. Some people have very similar titles and roles, but day to day, they're doing very different things based on the brand and the business model. So let's start there. Share a little bit about your role, what your day to day priorities are, and maybe most of all, how you measure success, like what makes a good day in your world? Awesome. Well, I'm happy to. So my title is probably unique relative to everybody in retail. I'm the president of brand technology and finance. And it's a pretty exciting role to have. And I really credit Jim Markham, who's our CEO, with having sort of the vision and to be provocative and bringing all these things together the way he's designed this role. The day-to-day is a pretty interesting opportunity, and it's very exciting because there's really sort of three legs of the stool at David's, the way we operate as a company. Nancy Vile, who's the other president, she's got merchandising, planning, and supply chain. Bob, the COO, has stores, real estate, and call center. And I have brand technology and finance. And those that three-legged stool, we are working together all day long, every day, to move David's bridal forward. And we spend a lot of time making sure that we are aligned and coordinated on the decisions that are made daily to drive David's forward. And not only is it that way operationally, but even monthly, seasonally, annual planning, as an example, we all three go and look at our data and our data farms, and we build views of what we think the business is going to do for that time period. And we build bottoms up and tops down views of what we think the business is going to do. Then we bring those three views together. And then we work collectively and collaboratively to ensure that we have a single view of what we think is going to happen during a certain time period at David's. And it seems sort of simple to say that, but it's a highly functioning 
sort of process that ensures that we stay aligned? Because I'm sure, as you know, it being in and out of retail, you're dealing with thousands of problems and thousands of things you got to deal with all the time. And to maintain that sort of connective tissue between the sort of three-legged stool pillars, it kind of makes it much more efficient. So there's not a lot of drama, <laughs> you know, we're able to just like move the business forward mm-hmm. and and stay aligned. And I think our out of the one thing we hear from dream makers, our employees a lot, is that they feel that the ELT, the executive leadership team, is extremely, extremely aligned and coordinated. I think that's a pretty helpful thing for frontline employees who are actually the experts at driving the company's performance. Oh, that's fascinating. And and I think, you know, your point around all of the all members of the leadership team being aligned and having that comprehensive insight into what's happening across these functions is definitely a point that resonates, I'm sure, with a lot, if not all of our listeners. And I think, you know, I could imagine that that enables not just getting that transparency and depth of perspective into what's happening in the immediate or short term, right? Like the day the day-to-day operations and efficiencies that are required for success, but also, you know, getting that long-term view of like where is our consumer going and where do we as a brand have an opportunity to go? And I think that that kind of connects to my next point or question because I find Davis Bridal to be such an interesting brand because of the the moments you represent and those life experiences that you aim to support customers through. Like I know I personally got my wedding dress from David's Bridal and it was a total surprise, by the way. I was like, let me just see what's happening here. It was me and my sister didn't plan. I was in sweats. It wasn't a whole big to do and I found it. But anyways. (laughs) I love that so much. You'll have to send me a picture. I'm dying to see it. I will. I will. It was quite a while ago at this point, but I I definitely have pictures. But anyway, I think what's interesting is like, obviously, there are weddings all year round, right? But then there are like the formal occasions and the prom, which which we'll get into in a second. And I'm curious, like, how does this approach or this mindset impact the way you think about marketing and loyalty creation, right? Because it isn't just, you know, it isn't a standard purchase that someone's going to come to the store once a week or once a month to buy something, right? Like it's very much aligned to key moments. So how does that change things for you personally in that marketing side? That is a brilliant question. And I'm going to bridge your first question and this question together just as a literal example of how we stay aligned and we move the business forward, given the fact that brides are changing and evolving all the time. Marketing as a discipline, I don't think since the Industrial Revolution in the early 1900s, has there been such a massive change in an operating discipline of consumer retail? Like, I just don't, there, it's a massive change in the way customers behave and marketing is changing and evolving and all the time. And what I found is that it's absolutely critical, absolutely critical as an executive at retail to bring your partners along this evolving marketing consumer behavior journey. It's imperative that I bring, in this case, Nancy and Bob and Jim with me, right? Because when they have a greater understanding of the challenges with marketing, they are incredible partners at helping us solve things that make marketing more difficult today, right? And an example of that is I have monthly SEO audits. We do them once a month and we are looking at every single thing from load times to errors to everything technical that you would look at in SEO. But Bob, Nancy, and Jim attend those audits with me, right? So they can understand because we're all interested in driving the business forward. And the more I bring them along, the better it is. And it helps us from an alignment. It helps us from a prioritization, you know, with capital and expense um, to problem solving, to solutioning. That's just one example of how to bridge one and two, because it's a wonderful way that we operate that allows us to be able to adapt to the changing conditions of marketing. Another example of that is I've led consumer insights teams for 20 years, right? 
I've had individual insights and analysts that were sort of diversified within departments that are retailer. I've also had ownership of like the central model where you have a COE and all the data insights are coming out. And in those environments in my past, we would gather all those insights and we'd do like a quarterly report out. Here's everything changing about the customer. Here's all the new ways that they are consuming marketing. And here are, you know, data consumption activities and all of these sort of different things. And then you would end up with like a 50 page deck and everybody that comes to the meeting is trying to consume that and figure out what do I do with it? How do I action it? Right. And another fundamental change that we've implemented is that we don't do that here. We are literally sharing insights and analytics and consumer observations three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, eight o'clock in the morning, every time the, the executive leadership team meets. That's another example, just like we're holding each other's hands as we go along. So an example of that was when we found out that TikTok is now a search engine. Well, that's a totally different model, Alicia, than just a content sharing platform or brand storytelling. If you are a search engine like Google, we have to think of you, design you, build tactics around you being a search engine versus just let's put out an influencer video and see what the performance is. So wanted to just bring that additional context to sort of bridges one and two together because it's a really, I think, fascinating way that we operate and it allows us to stay on trends as, as consumers change and action around it. But more specifically about the question you were asking in number two, it started with loyalty. I want to start with Diamond and then how we went from Diamond to planning because in the bride's journey, we have a, a precious, beautiful privilege and opportunity with our customer. She is proposed to, and she's excited and elated and happy, and she's looking at the ring, and she is ecstatic for about 15 minutes. And then she's like, oh my God, I got to plan a wedding. <laughs> like it goes from very high to very low, mm -hmm. like very, very, very quickly. So we have that planning journey. Then we have the dress part of the journey, which is getting the dress and then her bridal party and all the other things. But it started with Diamond. And it started with Diamond because we found out that 62% of all women that attend a wedding, not just a bridal party, but attend a wedding, buy something new to wear to go to that wedding. They don't want to wear something in their closet. So we were in a marketing meeting. This was at the end of 2020. And we were looking at this data and the teams were like, that is incredible. And somebody in the meeting said, well, what if we gave the bride the credit for the dress purchases for people that are going to her wedding? Like if they came to David's bridal and got their dress to wear to her wedding, we should give the bride the, the credit. Let's give her some points or something. And that was the genesis of Diamond is like, making the bride the center of the loyalty framework where everybody else's purchases feed into her account and she gets the credit. So it's a crowdsourcing loyalty model. And I don't know of one that exists. One may exist out there. Maybe you know of one, but I'm not knowledgeable of one. So it's the only crowdsourcing program that I know of. And then the next thing we looked at the research is the number one emotion she feels throughout the entire journey is stress. When you double click down from that and you ask her, what is the number one reason why you feel stress? That answer is money and budget. So then we said, okay, if we know that, what do we need to do for her as part of Diamond to solve those two problems? Well, we said, one, we're going to give her discounts on everything we offer. She gets special discounts that extends to her and her bridal party and everybody that attends her wedding that nobody else has. And, oh, by the way, let's give her a free honeymoon if she gets 5,000 points. Whoa. Like, it was like one of those meetings that you never forget. And you're like, okay, we are really, really on to something. This is super, super exciting. And I tested it with somebody internally. And they're like, wait, what? What do you mean a loyalty program at a bridal company? You mean somebody's going to get married 12 times and come to us every time to get married? I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not that kind of loyalty program. It's not repeat necessarily from the bridal. It's about crowdsourcing it at the 
bride level to allow her to get rewarded. And I told them and I told the board, you know, if cauliflower can become pizza, anything can happen, right? And we <laughs> took we, we took the leap of faith and we have almost 3 million members now. Alicia, you know, we've given away, we've had, I think, almost a thousand people qualify for free honeymoon. So vastly sort of changed how we think about that journey. So going back to planning, the very first thing she does is sign up for Pearl, which is allows her to plan her wedding and she gets a hundred points right there going into her diamond account. And then we move her along the journey all the way until she walks down the aisle. Yeah. I find it so fascinating, like the interplay between these experiences and how they all revolve around the core pain points of the bride. And I think your point around, you know, this crowdsourcing model, it's like being able to cast that wider net, but like everybody's kind of rallying around the bride. Like, I don't know, like there's like this element of the community behind the brand, which I know a lot of other retail businesses, retail brands are thinking about, like, how do we activate this community and get them to understand that humanity behind the business and, you know, just the purchase decision, right? So I think the strategy behind that is really fascinating. So in and of itself, you know, the wedding business is its own unique beast, in my opinion, as far as the buying experience, the decision-making journey, not just for the bride, but for guests as well. And I think, you know, your loyalty approach really aligns nicely to those realities. But I'm curious, like, what other dynamics are at play here? What other unique challenges do you face in in getting people's engagement, attraction, powering that discovery, right? Because like having this great, these great programs is, is one thing, but like getting that inbound top of funnel engagement to drive them down through that journey and drive them into that deeper engagement with the brand. I mean, you mentioned TikTok. I mean, that in and of itself is its own (laughs) beast at this point for the wedding industry. But is there anything else that's worth calling out here? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I mean, the thing that is unique to us and different from other sort of a ready to wear retailers or something of that nature is that we actually have, our customer has a journey, a specific journey they're going on. They sign up for Pearl, which means that's the way they're going to plan their wedding. And then they get into our checklist, which depending on how far out their wedding is, could be anywhere from 25 tasks to about 250 right? And so we're walking along that journey with her every step of the way. And with every step of that checklist, not only does it say, hey, go and design your wedding invitation so you can at least get a draft. We also say within that checklist, oh, and by the way, here's our premier partner, Shutterfly, and they have an exclusive offer for you. So the way we want to help her remember stress and money, right? Those are the two things. So everything that we're doing is about eliminating those two things. So we have the planning journey, we have the checklist, and we're walking her through that along the way. Now, the challenges that we face have come in the form of how can we serve her more as her needs change? So an example of that is she told us, I'm more inspired by wedding videos than I am static content, for example, imagery. So we launched a YouTube channel that has 24-7 wedding videos on it. So she can go and do it anytime she wants. She would tell us, I'm waking up at 2 in the morning in a cold sweat because I don't know how I'm going to do all this, right? So we launched. That was a challenge. Two, we didn't have enough UGC, she told us. I want more UGC. And it was really around not so much the dress as she wanted more UGC and inspiration of how she's going to design the look of her bridal party. Like, I'm thinking about black, but is that totally unorthodox? Absolutely not. Black's one of the hottest bridesmaids trends we have right now. Why? Because not only is the bride worried about money, the bridesmaids worried about money because our data right now show that a bridesmaid is an individual bridesmaids is spending anywhere between eight and a thousand dollars per wedding, Alicia, per wedding that she's in. And a lot of our bridesmaids, half of them told us they're in more than two weddings. So we really wanted to make sure that we were 
providing her inspiration for bridesmaids looks. Not only are they using black, which a bridesmaids can reuse as a formal gown or party gown or something of that nature, but it's also the eclectic mix where the bride is saying, you know what, I want champagne, but go figure out the dress that best fits your body. I want it in satin, but from there, go to David's, pick out any dress you want in champagne. So that's a challenge that we need to go and we needed to address immediately. They needed to be able to reach us 24 seven, just within questions in general. So we solved that problem. They told them, and we go down to every challenge, no matter big or small, Alicia, because we are a servant oriented company and a servant oriented brand. We serve her no matter what, right? And when she tells us, hey, I'm going to Google and searching David's, I just want to book my bridal appointment. I don't want to have to click over to you and click five more buttons. How can I do that easily? Well, we put our appointment booking protocol right on our storefront on Google, right? So we're constantly, constantly, constantly evolving and serving her because it's less about our challenge and more about what challenges is she facing and we need to serve her. You know, we heard from customers, if I'm plus size, I don't want to pay more. Why should I pay more for my size 16 dress than my sister does with a size four? So we have price parity. Not a lot of retailers do that. We choose to do that. So those are just like live examples that I can share with you that really, you know, drill down into combining this servant obsessed view of her and making sure that we are addressing everything we can to give her the absolute dream day that she has in her mind. I love that. I think there's something to be said about really getting into the mindset of the customer and what are those possible pain points? What could they be possibly looking for from us and how can we best serve them across all of those different points of interaction and engagement, right? Like like the appointment setting example is a perfect one, right? Like to be able to do that very quickly and efficiently and not have to jump through so many hoops. I do want to, you know, dig a little bit further into Gen Z in particular, because you mentioned going to weddings. I, I feel like this audience is, is so interesting because their age range, like I think it's anywhere from like teens to like 26, right? Like when they're starting to go to weddings. So like they're kind of like in this interesting like middle ground where they're experiencing the prom side, but also the wedding side. And I'm curious, like, what have you learned about this group? Because we're going to get into the prom stuff next, but I feel like David's Brettel has really made a concerted effort to think about the impact of influencers and more diverse library of content and how those content consumption behaviors are changing. And it seems like you're testing a lot and doing enough to learn a little bit more about them, especially as it relates to this particular category and this particular purchase experience. So there, have there been any headlines or big learnings that you know, you've been able to really drill down into and embrace on a much broader scale for the business? Yeah, absolutely. There's really three sort of main ones that I would say, Alicia, that are just fascinating, just from an intellectual curiosity standpoint, as you watch and observe and activate. The first one is going back to TikTok. Now, Two years ago, we had research that suggested that over half of all worldwide product searches started on Amazon, over half of all worldwide product searches, right? And so as a marketer, you're saying, oh no, all of my search budget is sitting in Google, but over half is in Amazon. So you sort of had to flip and say, okay, what is our Amazon strategy going to be? How do we play in that? How do we serve up our shop and, and all of that? So that was two years ago. This year, we have new, at the end of last year and this year, we have new research that says that actually has peaked and now is coming down because for Gen Z and Alpha, they are not going to Amazon to search for products. They're going to TikTok to search for products, right? And so now we've got, we have another flip that we've got to address. And just to illustrate the point, 25% of our brides are secondary brides and their age is 42 to 45 and older, right? 75% of our brides are under that age because it's first time weddings. So we've got a bifurcated strategy that we have to adjust to 
which enables us to serve both sets of brides. And that's sort of what I was saying earlier around Gen Z and Alpha being TikTok. Now TikTok is a search engine. Well, that's a, it's not just a different content strategy. You have to put content in that is searchable, quote unquote, right? That they can get to. It's not just their feed, right? It's not just their FYP. Now I need to make sure we've got hashtags for bridesmaids, satin bridesmaids, champagne bridesmaids, all the different search criteria that we would normally put in keyword purchases on Google or on our storefront at Amazon, right? So the whole idea of search is evolving and changing and it's evolved in 24 months and in the last six months. The second one is very, very interesting. I mean, extremely interesting for Gen Z and Alpha. So... (laughs) I'm old enough to remember when NPS Net Promoter Score was actually launched, right? I know Fred Reichel very well and and was so super proud of him when he put NPS in market. I don't even remember. That's probably in the early 2000s by now. And we still use Net Promoter Score today. And the reason why we do that is because we've had data and research for the last, as marketing executives, for the last 20 years that says, if you want to know and model out the best future sales you can get out of your existing customer base, it's, will you recommend me to your family and friends? That's the basis of NPS. That's what, that's sort of what it's known for. And so we ask that we hold ourselves accountable to NPS. That's one of my KPIs, right? Now we have data and research for Gen Z and Alpha is that's not their number one. Their number one purchase influence is not what their family and friends are are telling them. The number one influence for Gen Z and Alpha is what is TikTok telling me to buy? So you see the conflict now, right? My internal KPI is around, will you recommend us to family and friends? And we've got a generation of brides coming that says, well, that's not really my number one. It's what is TikTok telling me to buy? So we're having those internal discussions now, like, how do we think about that? What do we do with that? You know, is it here to stay? Is it a secular change? Is it a cyclical change? Is it more age? Like as they age, do they go back to family and friends? So you can see it's a very, very interesting discussion and intellectual and provocative discussion to have is like, how do we hold ourselves accountable to what they think about us and that attitude towards us and its influence on others. So that's the second one. And then the third one really around Gen Z and Alpha is, and it's it's so fun. I mean, it's so, 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 so fun, Alicia, but it's all these crazy, crazy fun things that they're doing at weddings now. Way different than what I did when I got married 30 (laughs) years ago. It is so much fun. It's like, I'm not going to have a flower girl. I'm going to have a flower dude. And he's coming out and he's throwing roses. Like, that's fun. I'm not going to have a wedding cake. I'm going to have a donut wall. We're not going to have a bartender. We're going to have a champagne fountain. You know, we're not going to have fish. We're going to do a barbecue. Or I'm not going to wear heels with my wedding dress. I'm wearing Converse or cowboy boots. It's so that whole generation's connection to their personal self-expression is absolutely inspiring. It is so fun and so exciting to watch them evolve how they get married. We want to just, we want to stay engaged and stay in that conversation and give them things like I mean, we went out and we're like doing a deal now with the donut companies so we can help them get offers for donuts for their donut walls, right? I think that's the one of the best parts about our job is just being so inspired by modern brides. I'm not going to wear a dress. I'm going to wear a custom pantsuit. I'm not going to do a white wedding dress. I'm going to do a black one or I'm going to do a blue one. Like, it's so fun, Alicia. It is such an exciting, fun part of our jobs. Yeah, I think the one thing that really rises to the top for me around Gen Z and Gen Alpha is just their connection to themselves and like their ability to express themselves and their hunger for that self-expression, like in everything that they do, which I think... In some capacities, it it could be a challenge for some brands because it's like the traditional quote unquote playbook for marketing and loyalty creation may not really apply anymore. But then to your point, it creates so much opportunity for that 
creativity and that innovation. So when you were talking about pantsuits, right, for your wedding or a black wedding dress, I mean, same thing can go for like prom, right? And I'm just seeing like those trends really evolve and, and change the way that brands need to merchandise and and market and inspire these audiences. So that kind of leads us to the Diamond Prom program, which I want to make sure we talk about because this is a whole different context, a whole different buying experience and journey. So I'm hoping we can get a little bit into that and kind of the the strategy behind it, how you went about developing the benefits and, you know, building out the benefit statement, I guess, for this audience, right? Because they're pulling from so many different sources for inspiration and have that hunger to express themselves. Yeah. So Diamond Prom, that was an incredible evolutionary option of Diamond that started last year. And from a strategic perspective, today's prom girls are tomorrow's bridesmaids, right? So there's definitely a CLV component to underpinning the strategy from our perspective. But, you know, from her, like we always start with her because we're servant led and servant purposed company. The idea behind Diamond was twofold. One was we wanted to reward schools. So that's an aspect of it that is not as public as everything else. And then we wanted to reward her. And the research from the prom segment was sort of a little bit simpler than all of the things that we have to think about emotionally for a bride. From the prom girl's perspective, she it was sort of very simple. One, I want a dress that expresses my personality, my self-expression. Two, I don't want it to be like anybody else's, right? Because there's all these different like IG accounts and Pinterest boards where girls put from a single school, put their dresses on there so nobody else buys it because nobody wants to show up in the same dress. And then the third thing is I want good deals. I want good deals on the shoes I'm wearing. I want good deals on the accessories. And I want a dress that is sort of reasonably priced, but fits rule number one and two. And that's what Diamond Prom was about. You know, so when we launched Diamond Prom, Diamond Prom had discounts that were associated with anybody that signed up and they would get a discount on their gown or their dress. And that was like $20. They received an alterations discount. They receive an alterations discount, which is very, very helpful for hems and lengths. And then three, they were able to get discounts on their accessories. But in addition to that, we took it a step further and wanted to reward the school. So you're probably too young, Alicia, to remember box tops, but I remember those from when I was a Oh, no, girl. I remember box tops. <laughs> They're still kicking, I think. Go figure. I know, I know. So in box tops, you know, turn in the box tops and you give them your school name and then the school gets, you know, baseball equipment and all that. Well, that was kind of the idea of a time behind rewarding the school. So what we told the school was we said, okay, we've got all these yummy things for your students when they're going to pick out, you know, their prom head to toe look. But we want to give you something in return. So if you have a certain amount of students that buy something from David's Bridal and enter in your school name, which we have a drop down in Diamond Prom, we will reward you with photo booths or scholarships or something of that nature. And last year we had 13 and a half thousand schools register for Diamond Prom across the country, which was an incredible amount given the fact that it was the first year we had ever done it. So Diamond Prom is super exciting. You know, we expanded our assortment because remember rule number two, she doesn't want to have any a look like anybody else. So we expanded the styles, right? And so instead of being narrow and deep, we went wider and narrow to allow more styles, right? And so the prom launch was January 30th. So it was only a few days ago. And it's our number one trending TikTok right now is our prom content. It's even beating bridal right now. So that's like a big, big statement. So extremely excited by the team sort of innovation and focus on serving her and giving her, you know, what she wants and everything for that night. It's so interesting. I do want to ask, like, 
So the fact that you're helping the schools and you're also helping your core customer, I mean, how do you look at that from a awareness building and marketing approach, right? Like, how do you balance trying to engage the schools versus consumers? And like, what does that approach look like from a messaging standpoint? This is solely out of curiosity because I find that so interesting. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. So there's a couple of ways that we're doing that. The first thing that we are doing is that we've changed the David's Bridal logo. And now the logo is David's. And then under that is brides, dresses, accessories, shoes, and so forth, and prom. And we did that because we knew that we had a a brand awareness opportunity as it relates to prom, because we've got bridal in our name, right? The research data say that, well, I can't buy my prom dress at a bridal retailer. That might be bridal gal. Like, so we had to clean all that up and clear all that up. So one of it is just sort of top level logo. The second strategy is when we launched our Pearl Marketplace, which is where people can go and look up vendors and bakers and all of that. We developed an internal B2B competency that we didn't have before because we were going directly to the consumer. So when you have a marketplace, we have to serve the local florist, the local photographer, the local DJ, the local band. And so we started to ramp up that B2B competency. And that B2B competency is the same competency we use to build programs to integrate with schools because it's an entity just like a venue, a wedding venue or or so forth. That is so interesting. And I know I'm hearing a lot of brands kind of lean into like, what does B2B look like for us? And it's just interesting to hear the strategy and vision behind it, because you still have to be true to the core of the brand and how you serve your core audience. But like, how do you add that, you know, additional value, not just for the customer, but for your business too? And I'm curious, like, what's the long-term vision for this program? Because On one hand, you have the B2B side, but then also I'm thinking about the consumer who maybe is, you know, having this first experience with you because of prom. And there's that opportunity to remain relevant and in the consumer's life, quote unquote, when they get ready and go on to that next stage where they are attending weddings and who knows, maybe even planning their own wedding. Like, are you kind of taking that full cycle, lifetime approach to these programs? Or like, how are you thinking about that strategically as the person who's spearheading marketing? Absolutely, we are. So it's interesting. We have a three-year roadmap for Diamond that has already been laid out with sort of annual goals and milestones. And those goals and milestones are driven by responses and research that we're getting from our members constantly. When we did our last research with Diamond, it was very clear there were three things they loved and there were three things they wanted us to change, right? So we're protecting the things they love, but we are addressing the things they wanted to change. The number one thing that they wanted to change is go back to the crowdsourcing element for a second. So if I'm a bridesmaid for my girlfriend's wedding, I'm going to David's Bridal, I'm buying my bridesmaid's gown for 75 bucks, and I'm giving the bride's cell phone number. So my bridesmaids purchase points go into her account. You follow me? It's the same thing with moms and so forth. But what the bridesmaids are telling us is like, that's great. I want to help my bride, but I'm in seven weddings as a bridesmaids. And oh, by the way, I'm engaged. I want points too. Right. And so that was one of the biggest things they wanted. So we are changing that now to do sort of, a, I guess, a double point issue to our customers. So if I'm buying, going back to my use case, I'm buying a bridesmaid's gown for my girlfriend's wedding. I'm going to give the bride's cell phone number, which is her loyalty number. And I'm going to give mine so the bride can earn points and I can because the bridesmaids are like, hey, I want to I want a honeymoon, too, (laughs) you know. And so we've got that laid out in our roadmap. So that's one thing. The second thing that we're doing to evolve the program is we're going to be expanding the events. So obviously, we've got brides and we've got proms, which we've connected to schools. But we have requests coming in for our customers to do quinceaneras, right? Because that's another event where there's, you know, people 
one sort of Cantonetta girl, but then there's a lot of purchases around that event. So that's an example. So we're going to be expanding the events in Diamond and Pearl. The next thing is we're going to be expanding travel vendors because we stay really close to the customers that win the honeymoons. They've been very clear about what they love and what they would, you know, what their recommendations would be to us to change and evolve in the future. We're going to be expanding travel vendors and travel options for that. And then the last thing that we need to change for Diamond that customers told us is for their rewards, meaning you get points at, or excuse me, you get gifts at 1,000 points to, or excuse me, 3,000 points, 4,000 points, and so on. They want those gifts to be monetary based, not coupon based. So an example was we had a, one of the rewards is, you know, you can spend $200 on photography and get $50 off of that, right? They don't feel like that's really valuable to them. They would rather have actual gifts for the rewards. So we're working through that and that's on our, our roadmap now, along with some gamification things that they told us they wanted. But that's really how we're going to evolve it over the next three years. Oh, that's so exciting. And, and Kelly, I feel like we've talked about quite a few of the trends that we've been tracking on retail touch points as far as like the evolution of loyalty and how programs and you know initiatives have had to adapt in light of new consumer behaviors, just the psychology behind what's driving brand connection and loyalty. So this idea of community, social sharing and content, but also this idea of a wider breadth and depth of reward strategy that is far beyond, like you said, just like the typical, you know, discount or a certain percentage off, you know, per purchase. But I'm curious, you know, as we think about the future of loyalty and, you know, what it means for your business, I mean, are there any trends that you're tracking, anything emerging that you think could or will likely have an impact of how you do your job and most of all, how you're engaging with your customers across all channels? Yeah, there are a few things. I mean, there's a few. One is just as we become smarter with automated tools like AI and machine learning, there's definitely ROI associated with that, right? The, the more we can learn from her, the more we can serve her when we're communicating with her. But I think the challenge is, how do brands balance that with the humanity of brands, right? It's like, how do you balance automation and the human component of that? When we serve a bride, it's an extremely intimate moment, very, very intimate. And, you know, she's coming in there for her bridal appointment. She is stressed. She is concerned. She doesn't know what's going to look right on her. She doesn't like this part of her body. She doesn't like that part of her body. These pictures last a lifetime. Her grandkids are going to see it, you know. And so it's a very, very intimate moment. And the humanity of that interaction is extremely special. You know, we train stylists on how to do that and serve the bride in a way that makes the moment of finding the dress almost as happy as saying I do, right? And so there's a strong humanity to our brand. But then on the marketing side, you're balancing that with the efficacy, efficiency, effectiveness, being with her along the journey, giving her the rewards that she wants, the tools she wants, the planning tools that she wants. And so it's a, it's a fascinating time on how you balance both of those because the human to human connection is the most powerful one on the planet, right? And so you don't want to lose that element, but it is a balance of you've got to serve her in both ways. And I think this the second thing that's sort of really, really exciting me is just the onset in the viral nature of social commerce right now. Like, how do we play in that? How does it look? We're launching it next month. So I'm kind of anxious to see that, you know, you you're sort of losing a little bit of the essence of your brand by handing over the transaction to somebody else. So I'm kind of interested to see how that plays out, but we also need to meet her where she's at. So, you know, I'm kind of excited to see how that plays out. And the third thing that's kind of exciting me is I love the fact that there's more brand to brand sort of storytelling in the market, brands that you don't think are going to come together to tell a story, but they do. Like 
an example, David's Bridal and Domino's Pizza. Why? Because pizza, people are serving pizza at their weddings. Like, I love the whole brand to brand disruption that's going on. I think that's super fun. Brands coming together to accomplish one plus one equals three. I love that. I love the fact that brands are doing that today. And so I'm uh, excited about those kinds of things that are coming this year for us. Yeah, I think obviously everybody's talking about automation and AI, social commerce. I feel like kind of fell by the wayside a little bit, but I agree. It's kind of been like this ever-present topic that I'm just waiting for it to you know bubble back up because we're seeing these consumers really not just spend their time scrolling, but like deeply engaging with the content. So we'll have to do a follow-up with you once that's out in the field and you have some learnings to share. But I'm really glad you brought up this idea of brand collaborations and partnerships because as we think about what the consumer wants, it's, you know, brand experiences that align to the context of their lives and, you know, what they're thinking, they're feeling. I feel like that's kind of been the connected thread throughout our entire conversation, right? Like what what our customer is feeling through this process, how can we better serve her and, you know, show some empathy in, in what we're doing from a marketing and services standpoint. So sometimes that means bringing other companies into the fold. So that's definitely a trend that we're tracking. Really excited to see what else comes to the forefront there. But Kelly, I think we covered so much ground. It's truly fascinating the work that you're doing and what you have been able to build with these programs and really transform this view of loyalty into not something that's transactional, but truly contextual and community driven. And it makes, it creates a sense of belonging and participation with the brand, which I think is really fascinating. So thank you again so much for taking the time out and sharing so much great detail into the work that you're doing. You're welcome. I had a blast. I'm happy to talk brides and weddings and prom all day long, every day. (laughs) I I can do it anytime you want. It's a fun, fun industry. Yeah. And and honestly, I feel like there are a lot of early adopters in, in this sector, not just because of their age or their behaviors at a core level, but just, you know, the context of what these experiences entail, right? Lots of discovery, lots of consuming of content, lots of seeking of inspiration and guidance, and it creates so much opportunity. So hopefully to all of our listeners, I hope you were able to extract a few great insights, learnings, takeaways that you can apply to your business, even if you're not in this incredibly fascinating world of proms and bridal. I think there are quite a few tidbits. But um, of course, if you have any follow-up questions for us or most of all for Kelly, we'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line on LinkedIn at Retail Touchpoints or on X at R Touchpoints. And of course, we're always tracking feedback on um, all of the podcast players. So leave us a rating and review there about this episode or about the show as a whole. We'd love to hear your thoughts and even ideas on who you think we should have on the show as well. But for now, that is it from us, everyone. Just a reminder, we're having these conversations every week, digging into the latest trends and and happenings in the retail industry. So if you haven't, be sure to subscribe to the show. That way you get the latest and greatest on your device. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, frankly, anywhere else. We're probably there too. We would love to connect with you there. Thanks again to all of you. Thanks to Kelly, and we will see you next time. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of Retail Remix. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, keep mixing it up.